Good morning and welcome to our third and final day of Innovate for Climate. Now today's session is going to focus on the role of the private sector and private finance in driving system transformation. We're going to focus on real solutions that are helping unlock private capital and actions that are helping the financial sector deal with climate risk. All that and sustainable value chains and emerging technologies. Now, before I welcome our first speaker, just in case you're joining us today, do remember there are still some exciting workshops happening, so do make sure that you sign up and please do join in with the conversation by tagging us on social media using the hashtag innovate for climate. Let me now welcome Mahta Diop, Managing Director and Executive Vice President of the International Finance Corporation, to share his thoughts. We have reached the final day of Innovate for Climate, and there can be no question about one of our key takeaways. Climate action must be an essential and urgent part of our recovery from the pandemic. We must collectively commit to ensuring uh, that our future is green, resilient, and inclusive. The stakes are high and more than 150 million people are likely to fall into po extreme poverty this year due to the ongoing impact of the pandemic. If climate change is left unchecked, it will push 132 million people into poverty over the next 10 years. The good news is that uh, uh, Recovering from the pandemic and addressing climate change are compatible goals and a tremendous opportunity for the private sector. In 2013, the year IFC issued the first 1 billion green bond, the total market for green bond was about 11 billion. In 2020, that market has grown to $280 billion. This is a huge increase, almost 2,500%. And uh, IFC has found that cities in emerging markets around the globe have the potential to attract almost $30 trillion in climate-related investment by 2030. It's clear that making the right investment today will certainly unlock new short-term gains. Short-term gains such as job creation, economic growth, but also it will deliver long-term benefits like decarbonizing our economy and making our world more resilient. The opportunity is here. We need the ideas, innovation, and finance from the private sector to capture it. And today's session are sure to inspire. But innovation isn't something that only found in the technology space. We are also seeing tremendous innovation in the financial sector. IFC recently issued our first blue loan to Indorama Venture Global Services. Smart banks now know that good environmental and social performance will be critical to attracting clients in the future. But even with considerable eco-friendly investment opportunities, mitigating the financial risk of climate change will be equally important. Financial institutions today are responding by future-proofing their portfolio. This means identifying climate risk and basing their investment decision and management responses on this assessment. We need to pursue a truly systemic response to climate change. Lasting sustainable success will only be possible when climate-friendly actions are incorporated into all industries at every step in the supply chain. We need to help hard to decarbonize sectors, green their operation by finding solutions to steel, cement, and other materials that are essential for development. IFC and the larger World Bank Group are stepping up in a big way on climate. Our new Climate Change Action Plan raises our targets for climate finance and commits us to reaching the goal of the Paris Agreement. We are doubling down to help our client achieve a net zero pathway. But we can't make progress alone. 
So urgency of climate change and the growing demand from companies will require that we all work together. Investors to be ready for future climate uh, shocks, we need to work with different partners. And that's what we are trying to do through Innovate for Climate. But let's not forget that the impacts of climate change are being disproportionately borne by the poorest and most vulnerable. The small farmers and herders in the soil, the fishing community affected by environmental pollution, overfishing and ocean warming, the indigenous people of the Amazon basin, those whose livelihood depend on natural resources as among those who are suffering the most of the consequences of climate change. Addressing this systemic disparity is not only the right thing to do, it's essential to the health of our economies and the health of our planet. We will need a strong partnership between government and the private sector, government and NGOs, CSOs and private sector, DFIs and private sector. All this world, working together, will be able to deliver right-size, real-world, equitable climate solution that work for everyone. What we are doing today on climate change, at the end of the day, is an effort to ensure that the poorest in this world, the most vulnerable, will be able to live in a world which is sustainable and be able to make a living out of it. So I would like to thank you and I know that you will be inspired by the examples that we are, will be hearing from today. And uh, on my side, I'm already very inspired from what I heard. So thank you. Bye. Marcus, I thank you very much for opening today's session on rethinking finance for climate action. Mobilising private finance for climate action in developing countries is a really big priority for the World Bank Group. So we were very pleased that our first panel would be looking at innovations that are helping drive this forward. I'd like to welcome Axel van Trotzenberg, World Bank Managing Director of Operations, and Tanya Ortiz Mena, Chief Executive Officer of Innova, to discuss the growing interest in this topic. Um, Axel, if I may come to you first. You're overseeing, I know, record World Bank lending to developing countries to help deliver a green but resilient recovery from COVID, aren't you? But given all the competing development priorities in low and middle income countries, I'm thinking about healthcare, water, sanitation, energy, and education access, what is the chance of building back better and greener in a way that doesn't leave anyone behind? Well, it is basically thinking differently. You can no longer continue with the business as usual. You will need to meet more tests, and the test has to be that we need to think about our environment. We need to be uh, uh, ha having a greener approach. We have to be more resilient in our thinking about this, as well as inclusive. And these tests will have to be met. We can also not separate the uh, climate change from the rest of the development agenda. This has all to be integrated. And more, you can no longer look at, this is an issue for the industrialized world, or for richer developing countries, it is for all. And they are facing different problems. So you have uh, problems from China to uh, uh, Africa, and they are different. Because what is actually interesting is that in some of the developing countries, there is an enormous amount of emissions, in particular middle-income countries, I'm thinking in Asia. But in Africa, it's disp disproportionately affected by climate change, although it's only responsible for a few percentage points of the emissions. However, it is disproportionately affected by the effect of climate change. Please look at the Sahel zone, uh, look at other areas badly affected in terms of uh, disasters. So we have to think in an integrated way on this and have to act. And acting is not only in words by doing. So what is, is, is required is that you need not only in your approach to think differently, you also need to provide massive 
financial support because that is what is necessary. And finally, there is urgency. Urgent today, you need to act on, 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 on the crisis related to COVID, but at the same time, we also need urgency to act on climate. We cannot lose time. And that is what is required from international organizations, but in for, for that matter, from the international community, we cannot lose time. And that means we need to be very ambitious and aggressive in uh, embracing climate change in our projects, DNA that, and act and develop the necessary projects. Tanya, um, to you, in Mexico, IE Nova, your company, has established itself as a pioneering private investment company in the energy sector. So what has enabled you to invest in renewable energy? Uh, that is correct, Anita, and, and thank you. Uh, Hello to everyone. And, and, and you know, you know, we've been investing in Mexico for over 20 years, and we were born with sustainability as part of our DNA. Because what we do in Yenova is that we develop energy infrastructure in Mexico that enables a reliable energy supply, a clean energy supply, and an affordable energy supply. And that is critical for a developing country like Mexico that has a population of close to 100. 30 million people, a growing middle class, and very importantly, a manufacturing economy that's uh, dedicated to export. So in order to allow the Mexican economy to continue to grow and to continue to be competitive in world markets, our role is to, again, ensure a sustainable energy supply. And this has had different meanings throughout the past 20 years. We started out by very aggressively promoting the use of natural gas in Mexico, which meant that households were not burning uh, wood or uh, LPG, they were burning natural gas. It, mean, it meant that heavy industries were no longer burning diesel, they were burning natural gas. And very importantly, it meant uh, the large power generators, primarily the state-owned the state utility, was no longer burning fuel oil, but they were burning natural gas. So that was the first step in, let's call it, our path towards sustainability. But then as uh, renewable technology began evolving, uh, we determined that Mexico was one of the richest countries in the world in terms of, of, of renewable resources. We have very rich solar resources, but we are, we're also very rich in wind resources. So we started developing these resources to now be able to supply power from renewable resources to the large uh, industrial consumers in Mexico. And very interestingly, we're also generating renewable power in Mexico to export energy into the United States. So it's one more example where Mexico can be competitive by exporting certain uh, uh, resources, and in, in this case, uh, renewable and sustainable resources into other regions of the world. Uh, so uh, we are working hand in hand, particularly with the IEFC, to try to determine what the next technologies are that allow us to continue to move down this path of sustainability. I mean, that, that's a very, very positive story. Axel, just turning to you, what, what is the bank's plan for expanding the availability of climate finance to developing countries? How, how exactly can we incentivize greater private investment across the key transitions needed to address climate change? Well, this is going to be one of our key challenges to do the maximum possible uh, for the World Bank Group. And over the last five years, we have mobilized uh, from our own resources $83 billion and we need to scale this up further. I think that over the next five years, we will get over well over $100 uh, billion. In this context, what we need to do is not only the scaling of this, but also that about 35% of our financing will be climate related. We call that climate co-benefits and that will be done. Secondly, we need to say that we uh, retain a good balance between adaptation and mitigation investments, and that we will uh, do at the 50-50% level. And then we will need to involve the private sector, not only through our private sector arms, the uh, IFC and MIGA, 
but also with our own investments and how we can actually support that. Concretely, for example, in, uh, with solar energy, you will need also distribution networks and they may need public money. So we are looking at investment opportunities that can complement also private sector uh, uh, capital with public sector capital like uh, from uh, institutions like the World Bank. And then we need to re realize that particularly in poorer countries, you will need to help in the de-risking because sometimes these environments are still risky for investors. For that purpose, for uh, we have created within the fund for the poorest, a private sector window that helps de-risk investments. And that will, will be necessary. Finally, what we also want to do is that we have advisory and technical assistance uh, uh, services that help in the advisory for governments, namely not only in the regulatory areas, but also in helping how we can get private sector uh, uh, participants uh, in middle and in lower income countries. At the end of the day, this is about a partnership, a partnership where governments work together with multilateral institutions and the private sector to make it happen. But what we need jointly is a sense of purpose, clear objectives, and uh, a realization that we have to act together and scale because even with the scaling of the bank, this is not enough. It will require us a multilateral development bank and all actors together, particularly also on the private sector to make it happen. I think there is a good potential, but there is a need to act as quickly as possible. Well, let, let's pursue that a little further. Tanya, just how important are green loans in incentivizing clean energy investment in developing countries? And what market forces are improving the business case for that sector? I mean, I think it's uh, in the IFC's role in particular in developing, uh, let's call it sustainable energy uh, in Mexico has been critical. Let me give you an example. In Mexico, Yenova has a portfolio of close to 1,000 megawatts of, of uh, solar and wind energy. So uh, we started working with uh, the World Bank IFC a few years ago, and we're able to obtain the first uh, IFC uh, we're the first company to obtain a green loans principle uh, loan by the IFC in Mexico for $100 million. And the fact that we had gone through the IFC's very stringent and thorough review on our, on our, on our sustainability practices allowed us then to attract investment from uh, the uh, JICA, the Japanese Development Corporation, from the United States EFC. It allowed us to attract uh, uh, loans from uh, the NAD Bank, which is a U.S.-Mexico bilateral uh, development uh, corporation. So again, by working with the World Bank, it has enabled us to access resources from other development uh, uh, banks uh, throughout uh, the world. So it becomes critical not only in accessing resources, but also in improving your ESG practices. And when Axel talks about um, about uh, other types of support. We're currently also working uh, with the IFC on our sustainability uh, link framework, which really reviews the overall uh, practices of the company. And again, enables us to continue to improve and therefore allows us to contribute to access new sources of funding. And finally, with regards to, to technological innovation, we're also working with IFC on some pilot projects on on batteries, for example. So it's more, uh, I think, I, I would call it, it's more of a partnership, um, of a partnership that we have with IFC. So uh, very, very positive and critical uh, to promote the development of, of clean energy. Well, thank you very much to our panel for that absolutely fascinating conversation around innovation that can really get private finance flowing at scale. Earlier, we caught up with Alok Lohia, Group CEO of Indorama Ventures PLC, and we asked him to share his thoughts on innovations to scale climate action in developing countries. This is what he had to say. Dear friends, it is my privilege on behalf of my colleagues to present to you Indorama Ventures and our association 
with the World Bank affiliates. We have recently signed a blue loan, a longer term nine year facility that will go into investments to clean up and reduce the waste along the river banks, which end up finally into the oceans. The circularity and the climate change go hand in hand. When we are reusing and recycling what we have already produced, that reduces the emissions into the climate. And therefore, it is something that achieves both reduced wastage and a better climate. At Indorama, it is our aspiration to be a leading firm in circularity and reduce the carbon emissions that we have in our chemical businesses. With the support of World Bank affiliates, we are well on our journey and we have set our targets. The first target being in 2025 to reduce our energy and our water conservation, as well as to reach 750 kilotons of recycled PET. Going forward, we are making our further targets for 2030 even more ambitious. And therefore, the support that we are getting from the World Bank and their affiliates is so important to our journey. I wish to thank you for your support for this public-private partnership. And I think that together we can make a difference. Again, thank you very much for providing me this privilege to talk to you. Thank you. And meanwhile, please keep safe. From innovation to implementation now, I'm pleased to be joined by Bill Winters, CEO of Standard Chartered, and Fiona Reynolds, CEO of Principles for Responsible Investment. And they're going to talk us through what it's going to take to get the financial sector fit for purpose in an era of climate risk. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Bill, if I might start with you first. Global banks have significant climate risks to deal with, but they have significant resources to address their problems. What is the advice you could give to emerging market banks with less capacity to deal with this kind of challenge? Where do they even start? Yeah, well, it's very nice to be here, Anita. Thanks for having me. And uh, the, the question is, is, uh, is right on the mark, uh, because as we know, the, the, the worst effects of climate change will be felt in the developing world. So uh, in Africa, for example, where uh, across the continent, uh, Standard Chartered has uh, operates in 17 markets, but there are 19 cities in, with a population in excess of a million people uh, that are on the coast that will be severely impacted uh, by even a moderate increase in, in global temperatures. And uh, In addition, uh, we know that there will be literally hundreds of millions of people that would be infected, affected uh, by rising temperatures uh, in the north uh, as uh, desertification uh, moves south and through the rest of the continent as weather patterns change. And of course, in, in the emerging markets, these in the developing countries, uh, these economies are least resilient to the kind of change that uh, that, that we might fear, uh, much less resilient than what we would expect in uh, in Europe or the U.S. or, or uh, parts of East Asia. So, what can an emerging market uh, bank do about this? And first and foremost, we must do everything we can to reduce the impact of climate change. That that's got to be the top priority for everybody. This is not a fight that we have we've yet lost, and I'm sure, I'm sure we'll spend most of the time today talking about that. But there is still the risk, no matter how uh, how diligent our efforts are. Uh, first and foremost is to understand what those risks are in, in the corporate and the uh, the retail parts of the business. And we're doing a huge amount of work on that. Uh, central banks around the world, supervisors, regulators are doing a huge amount of work to understand what the consequences are of increasing temperatures in different economies. And the best that, that a bank can do to, uh, to deal with that is to help clients transition to the greatest possible extent. Uh, and to prepare for uh, some of the, the consequences that can come along in terms of, of uh, adequate capital, liquidity, uh, concentrated loan exposures in the most affected sectors. Uh, this is what we're doing in, in, uh, in Standard Chartered. I think it's what many local market banks are doing as well. Uh, but as you point out, uh, in some cases, they're less well equipped. So we're all working together to see if we can both prevent, but if we can't prevent all of it, uh, then at least to mitigate the, uh, the downside. Now, I understand that you're actively promoting carbon markets. Can you tell us a little bit more about why this is a key solution to climate change? Yeah, and, and it does play into your uh, your question about uh, developing countries. The, the, the idea, is, first and foremost, is that we all must produce to the greatest extent possible. Right? Uh, number one, it, we just must reduce uh, because there's, there's no amount of, of carbon markets that can offset what we can do in terms of improving our own underlying operations. Uh, second is we must properly measure and record 
debt which we're emitting. So what's our baseline today and how are we, uh, how is that developing over the, the course of the next 10, 20, 30 years? Uh, we know that there will be some sectors that are difficult to abate. Uh, there will be some exposures that, that simply can't be reduced to zero. And we know that we need to get to net zero by 2050 at the latest. And we need to make very significant progress even over the next nine years to 2030. Uh, the, 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 the opportunity then is to use the offset market to get potentially tens or maybe eventually hundreds of billions of dollars of money from the pockets of people like Standard Chartered Bank, who have a, who've made a commitment to net zero, into the pockets of people who can actually take the carbon out of the environment, whether that's through uh, reforesting or avoiding deforestation or installing renewable power sources or the many, many other steps that, that can be taken. And we know that, that in terms of financing these investments, these transition financings, uh, the West and the and the uh, Europe, the uh, the, the U.S. Uh, and again parts of Asia are pretty well equipped to finance this transition. The developing countries are not, uh, with something like uh, only 10% of the required financing available. So what the carbon markets can help do is to get the the, the cash from the hands of of the people who are looking to reduce their emissions by using offsets into the hands of people in many cases in developing countries that are best positioned to actually. Uh, uh, reduce the impact of, of greenhouse gas emissions on the global climate. Fiona, you lead a group of investors interested in seeing a rapid global transition to a low carbon economy. Now, nearly two years ago, those investors committed to disclose climate risks in their portfolios. What are those early disclosures telling us? Uh, yeah, that's right, Anita, and thanks for having me. Um, yes, so all PRI signatories need to report on an annual basis on their responsible investment activities. And as you said, in January 2018, we introduced a set of open and closed indicator questions that are basically based on the TCFD recommendations into our reporting framework. And the indicators were voluntary for signatories to report to in 2018 and 19. And then in 2020, we made the governance and strategy indicators mandatory to report, although voluntary to publicly disclose. And so with making them, making them mandatory, we saw a significant uplift in climate disclosure. So we had over 2,100 signatories reporting, and they represent nearly $100 trillion in assets under management. And 410 of those investors opted to publish at least part of their responses based on the TCFD indicators. And then we undertook analysis of the reporting and we found that there were different levels of maturity in responses, not surprisingly. And within that analysis, we did basically uh, put, we did a four category staircase. So on the staircase, we put plotted people aware. So that was at the bottom rung of the staircase, building capacity, responsible, and then strategic at the top. I don't really have great things to report here. 77, 74% were in the aware or the starting category and only 2% were in the strategic category. So for strategic, by that we've, we've said that the response meant that you had performed climate scenario analysis, that you completed all four pillars of TCFD, that you've made your disclosures public and that you have an organisation-wide climate strategy and set climate-related targets. So the analysis clearly shows that while many investors are now reporting, and that's great, much more needs to be done for that really strategic organisational wild climate strategy. So we're continuing to work on capacity building. We're working with regulators around the world. I think they really need to play their role to ensure that we have good climate reporting, such as TCFD, as mandatory at some point. So good starting, a lot to do. Our new reporting is just closed off. So I really hope that next year and after we've done the analysis for this reporting, that we'll have more positive things to report. Well, I mean, yes, I mean, let's hope so, because that's quite a disappointing uh, assessment, I think you've just given us. I mean, from the sound of things, and maybe I can get both of your responses to this, it, this sounds like a tanker that you're trying to turn around. How quickly do you anticipate that things might accelerate in a meaningful way? Let's start with you, Fiona, and then I'll get your take on this, Bill. Well, I think you're right. I think it is a tanker. I think it is turning, but it's slow and it needs to be accelerated quickly. I do think that every year that passes, we're going faster and faster and more is being done now than ever before. So there are some, some positives, but investors 
can't just be asking companies to do things. They can't just be asking governments to do things. They have to also understand and take action on these issues themselves. And that's what we're trying to do through a number of our initiatives. Mm. And Bill, you too, that, that same question. I mean, are you optimistic about how the speed of change can work out? I, I, I am optimistic uh, because I see an, an absolute groundswell of, of movement right now. Uh, it, it, it started as, as Fiona said, with, I think with, with uh, a lot of focus on, uh, on, on the base levels of data and disclosure. Um, now, just in, in a few years, TCFD, uh, this, the, the climate change disclosures, have uh, gone from, from being, uh, I think, non-contributive to materially contributive in terms of helping investors and companies themselves to understand their, uh, their emissions. And that's now uh, crescendoing into a set of net zero commitments, which I suspect uh, when, uh, when some companies made net zero commitments or, or talked about being Paris aligned or things like that, uh, they had no idea how they would actually accomplish that, nor did they have a good idea where they were starting from. Uh, and I, when I look at the amount of work that I know my own company, but many others as well, the amount of work that we're doing right now to understand the baseline better, uh, to understand what, what it means to transition to net zero, uh, what the impact will be on our business, in the case of a bank, what the impact will be on our clients. Uh, you know, for us, the, the, the vast majority of our emissions uh, that we're taking responsibility for uh, come through our clients, the people to whom we provide financing uh, or other services. Uh, but I see a, just a, a crescendoing of, of focus on and support for uh, net zero commitments. And this, uh, mm. this uh, task force for scaling voluntary carbon markets, which is, which is something that I have the, the privilege of chairing, has now brought together, we've got over 400 members of this task force, so 250 separate organizations, including, uh, yeah, the, the, I would say, the, the, the core NGO community, academic community, investors, investor alliances, and of course, the, the corporations who are, who are making the net zero commitments. So while we're not trying to, uh, to define what a net zero commitment is, other people, are, uh, science-based targets initiative, et cetera, are doing that, uh, we're creating one set of tools for the corporate uh, CEO or treasurer or board to use to accomplish those commitments. And we see the, the interest and the commitment to actually delivering on this, uh, building at, at a very rapid pace. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we can get there, but we, we really don't have any time to waste. No, uh, Fiona, I mean, you, you've said that the early disclosures aren't as cheering as we might hope, but you must have come across some success stories. I'm saying this, hopefully, please God, you've come across some success stories. <laughs> if you could share some with us and, and perhaps tell us how you can see them being replicated by other investors. Oh, absolutely. And I should say that when we started the reporting, I feel very positive, like Bill is saying, that things are moving. We started the reporting because we wanted investors to get used to using those indicators. These were new, people weren't doing this. So our expectations weren't particularly high in the beginning. They are high for the new reporting that we're doing this year, I've got to say, and seeing things moving. On some positives, what are we seeing? Well, we've got a very broad range of um, signatories. And I think that within our signatory base, we created a leadership group with UNFFI that we launched called the UN Convened Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance. So this has got a group of 37 asset owners. They represent nearly 6 trillion in assets under management. And they've looked at climate risk and science, and they're moving beyond climate risk assessment to portfolio alignment. And we've had 18 of the group who've already set a 2025 net zero, you know, on their road to net zero target. And the targets are in a range from 16 to 29% by 2025 across listed equities and bond portfolios. And, you know, today I think, and um, Bill alluded to this, really just setting a 2050 target is not enough. We have to move beyond long-term targets. They're important, but we need near-term term targets. We need to move beyond just sort of analysis and investigation to implementing. We need to be setting those targets and setting out how we're going to achieve them. And just recently, the UN Secretary General at the Biden summit referred to the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance as the gold standard in net zero commitments. So in addition, um, as steps towards net zero, the group have published things like a coal phase out position, the target setting protocol that we've developed is public, it's for the good of everybody. We've got very active in policy advocacy, engaging with the, you know, the G7, the G20 and COP with key asks from the investment sector about stopping fossil fuel subsidies, phasing out coal, carbon pricing. 
We're working with science. So we've established a scientific advisory body to ensure a real scientific basis for all the net zero commitments that we make. We're working with scientists on sectorial, sectorial pathways to net zero and collaborating with a whole lot of other initiatives, including the um, group that Bill was talking about, the Task Force for Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets, to really get things moving. And as asset owners, we're also working on the asset manager engagement. Asset owners are the clients and they need their managers to be able to move as well. So a lot of fantastic leadership happening. Now, it's a smallish group. I was saying 37. But this hasn't been done before, setting 2025 targets and then working out how to get to net zero and what those targets should be. So coming together as leaders and starting this work means that we make the work available for others and others will follow as they see what um, what their colleagues are doing. And so that's really exciting. And we're also um, gone out to talk about scaling up blended finance vehicles. So being able to work with managers, calling for managers to work with the asset owners to work out how are we going to fund climate solutions? Because we won't get there without solutions. Well, may I say both of you have given us quite the roller coaster ride, uh, slightly depressing, then uplifting at the end. But thank you very much. Well, that was, that was really fascinating from our guests there on the financial sector as it is now and where there's scope to shape up. Now to our final panel session. For this panel entitled Sustainable Value Chains, Businesses and the First Mover Advantage, we're joined by Paul Pullman, co-founder of Imagine. Domingo Valdez is with us, CFO of Vinte. We have James Rogers, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Appeal. Ndidi Enole Adosian is here, Chair of Circular Economy Innovation Partnership, Africa Neros, Growing Business Group, and Stefan Dubotsky, CEO of Lensing. A very warm welcome to all of you. If I can start with you, Paul Pullman, you've been working in this space for quite some time now. Could you help us to prioritise what is the number one barrier, in your opinion, that needs to be addressed to unlock a major delta of action in sustainable value chains? Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity and happy to be on this uh, distinguished panel. Well, since COVID, we have seen more businesses actually stepping up and in many cases, I believe, are now ahead of the governments when it comes to the broader climate change uh, commitments, if you want to. Although many are expected uh, companies to cut back during 2020, we've actually seen an acceleration of those commitments. COVID has shown above all that the long-term multi-stakeholder models uh, are actually more robust. Models that are already building in a strong uh, relationship, if you want to, with the supply uh, chain. Now, however, the reality is that we're far from what is needed to stay below one and a half degrees, and we still have an enormous ambition gap to uh, overcome. If you look at uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the top uh, uh, companies, about 75% uh, uh, short of what is needed uh, by 2050. And many haven't even started giving 2030 targets, whereas you know we need a 50% reduction already now. In fact, we've seen some uh, industries, like let's say the, the biggest banks, actually increasing their commitments to fossil fuel versus decreasing since the Paris Agreement. So we have a chance, uh, we have an opportunity here that we need to seize. Uh, in fact, the reality is that half of the commitments on climate change can actually be done today already and they can be done uh, profitably. So many commitments still in the companies are scope one and two, what is basically under their own control. And very uh, little actually of the emissions are in scope one and two. Most of the emissions are in scope three and beyond. But we have too many companies that still think today that they can outsource their value chain and also outsource their responsibilities. And that doesn't work anymore. Increasingly, uh, companies are held accountable for their total impact. So I think the biggest gap coming to your question is actually the gap of courageous leadership, especially by market leading companies. If we get the leading companies to move and their CEOs to be more courageous, that will send an enormous signal to create change in the value chain. 60% uh, of the CEOs in this world claim that they have zero visibility right now about their supply chains 
uh, beyond their first tier suppliers. So there's a lot of work to be done. And some of the barriers that we have to take away very simply is, is the first one is to create more transparency in the supply chain and have an availability of high quality data to allow this performance tracking, obviously standard data that can be compared. The second one is we need new forms of partnership. When the issues are in the value chain, we want people to work together and collective action is absolutely crucial to scale up. No company alone can get to regenerative agriculture or solve the issues of plastics in the oceans, et cetera, et cetera. And the third thing we need to do is attract significant investment. This is not going to be for the faint hearted. We do need to invest behind this conversion at the speed that we need it. If you just look in the energy sector alone, uh, a low carbon transition would require at least $2.3 trillion a year in investments over a decade. So we need to channel that. And last but not least, we need to work hand in hand with especially the governments on getting the right policies and regulations in place. Unfortunately, many of the policies that we have are still creating the unintended consequences. Many of the subsidies that we have are frankly still perfer subsidies, be it in the food and land use, be it in the climate change. So these are the four areas that I think we need to attack. As we work on this transition, we need to ensure that we keep the people in mind. This gets to into human rights, the safety of your workplace, mm. what, women's equality, just transition. It is, after all, a plan that we're putting out there for people. Well, you, I mean, you've given us quite a comprehensive overview of the landscape. Uh, one of the topographies that you mentioned there was, was courage and commitment from company CEOs. Let's, let's take a look at one company in more detail now. Domingo Valdez, I understand that Vinte has worked with the IFC's Edge Green Building Standard to boost the construction of sustainable homes in Mexico. How exactly are your customers responding? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, we were very proud of the uh, being the, the home builder with the largest amount of certified edge homes in the world, currently with uh, more than 5,000 homes certified and growing. Uh, what we like the most about the edge certification is that it implies being green at all levels of the value chain, um, including the suppliers, the products, and uh, building the homes itself. So regarding our customers, they are responding very positive. Um, we have been growing double digit uh, this year, and we had a good results in 2020, 2020, even with the GDP down 8.2% in Mexico and with the fear of the pandemic just everywhere. Um, what this means is that not only our customers like our sustainable developments, but also local governments who, as you know, are responsible for permits across Mexico as well as institutional investors, as in 2020, we uh, got to sign credit facilities with the IFC, the IDB, the Bank of China, Cape Hanna of South Korea. And we also issued Latam's first ever uh, SDGs bonds for our corporation in, in the public markets. And we were capitalized by IFU and, and the Danish pen, pension funds uh, five months ago. All of this uh, in the middle of a pandemic. So thanks to being innovative since founding the company regarding green and social impact, um, we have been able to replicate and multiply the business model in good times and under complex environments. James Rogers, turning to you, agribusiness is your business. Um, how have technologies and innovations helped reduce risk along your supply lines? And how do they benefit those most exposed to climate change? What sources of finance are making this possible? Yeah, well, uh, certainly tackling supply chain challenges are is probably one of the largest opportunities that we have in front of us as a species right now. Um, if we look at the uh, particularly related to, to food supply chains, the food waste issue has been measured to be a $2.6 trillion problem globally. And that's really a supply chain issue because once you harvest a piece of a fruit or vegetable, it's got a finite period of time uh, before it perishes or, or goes bad and loses its economic value. And so uh, at Appeal, we found a way to use food to preserve food. Uh, we add a little extra peel to the surface of fruits and vegetables, and that gives them more time. And by giving a fruit or vegetable more time, we have the opportunity to both reduce waste downstream for consumers so you can buy food, have it in your home, and be less likely to throw it away. 
But when that happens, you actually are creating more value upstream as well, because the product that's being produced uh, by a small producer, uh, potentially in an emerging market, uh, has greater market access, has a greater probability that what they're growing is going to actually be consumed and as a result, uh, create economic value and at the same time, reduce waste and so save uh, or offset all of that energy, all of that water, all of that carbon that went into moving the product from point A um, to point B. And so the opportunity really is, uh, is, is to align the economic value, which comes from reduced waste, with the environmental value, uh, which also comes from reduced waste. And um, we do that um, through uh, private financing, where... Uh, there are uh, what started as grant financing to figure out how do you do this? How do you use food to preserve food? Um, kind of the upstream R&D work. And then transitioned that into um, now that we have this technology, um, where can we introduce it in the market so that it creates value for consumers, value for grocers, and ultimately value for, for growers? Thank you very much, James. Um, Paul Pullman started this conversation off by sort of throwing down a gauntlet to companies, to governments, saying, you know, mean it and get on with it. Now, indeed, you've got experience changing minds in large organisations. What are the best arguments to really embed circular economy thinking into the DNA of a multinational company? Um, thank you very much also for inviting me here. Um, a great question, and thank you for referring back to Paul Pullman because he really inspired one of the um, models that I'm going to speak about. So what I've found from experience is really there are various perspectives. Um, I've worked with then a large corporate, actually Africa's largest, to initiate and institutionalize um, sustainability. And that led me to the conclusion that circular economy is really one of the most pragmatic, practical ways of implementing what is very often a very, very broad and, and vague um, term. And what I've learned from that experience, also working specifically over the last five years with another large organization, namely Unilever, from the perspective of a nonprofit um, that I founded 21 years ago, to implement a program that was an extension of their supply chain and where we're now trying to embed circular economy principles as a means of actually taking a, a large corporation's perspective and implementing it at the bottom of the pyramid, not because it's a, it's a mandate, but because it's something people really believe in. And there are really seven things I've learned. I like the number seven. So I've always worked or I designed um, a methodology called the seven pillars methodology that speaks around seven different aspects that you need to embed in really understanding and ensuring that an institution um, truly has everybody involved. So, so first of all, you've really got to see that there is a larger system that you're working as part of. It's a multi-sector, multi-actor, multidisciplinary system. And that applies not just outside of the organization in terms of things like SDG 17 and the partnerships, but also within. Second, that's really keen is that people have to learn to work with one another and work with people, especially that they've never worked with before. Now, having worked with government, private sector, nonprofit sector and development agencies, um, I realize that sometimes crossing that barrier is very, very difficult, whether that's within an organization, whether finance guys are working with the marketing guys, or working with the environment guys or outside where the private sector is trying to collaborate with nonprofits or the public sector, it's hard. Hard, but it's also a huge learning curve. Um, the third has to do with perception. So in other words, if we see um, circular economy as another nice to have, or a bit like sustainability is often seen as corporate social responsibility, we have a problem. It really is a means to solve problems. It's a way to solve problems much more effectively, much more risk averse. It's a huge mitigant against stranded assets, which the financial sector is finally beginning to realize is a huge potential um, negative on this big, big, big growth and profit drive. So suddenly environmental factors, social factors, and um, economic sustainability factors have become mainstream because finance has come to understand it and we've translated it into their language. Um, for me, a fourth is um, really leadership. Paul spoke to this. We need to have courageous leadership. 
And that comes from a deep, deep understanding and ability to communicate who and what an organization is and what it is here for. And it's not here to make profits, it's actually here to create value. Very important also is building a culture. So people need to um, really live what they say. Action has to follow from thinking, but also has to align. It can't be contradictory. And we need people driving that, that are innovative and have the skill and the vision to redesign products, processes, and business models so that the economy really moves from being linear to being a more circular one so that we're actually asking ourselves, it's not just how do we get rid of waste or how do we better um, redeploy waste, but how do we design waste out of our system? And how do we ensure we have courageous leadership in a culture that just refuses to create products or put in place systems or processes that generate waste? And the last two points are really impact. I think that was also spoken about before, the ability to collect data and measure and making sure that our supply chains are not just transactional, but rather our relationships that are creating value all across the value chain. And it is very possible because I've done it, I've seen it, and it works. And it added value in the case of Dangote, and it added value in the case of Unilever, so that even when there was a downturn in the economy, those supply chains that were truly meaningful and value creating continued to create value and grow. And the last is really execution and how important it is to execute with a multitude of actors and create a sense of community that goes beyond the large corporation to actually extend to the value chain. And that's really critical in a continent like Africa because the majority of the people and the businesses do not exist in the large multinational trans transnational corporations, but are really small and medium scale enterprises that need to be integrated into the value chain. And it's really good that companies are becoming more and more accountable and being forced to be more transparent and not just disown, no, I can't see beyond a certain level, but everything that happens right down to the bottom of the pyramid is absolutely the responsibility and accountability of the large corporations and the more this becomes clear, the more likely it is that boards and the highest level of governance who have that fiduciary duty take accountability for what companies do. Stefan, the world has been trying to tackle deforestation in supply chains for such a long time. And I think it's fair to say with mixed results, what can businesses do to help? And, and what role is there for institutions like, say, the World Bank? With changes like that, we need to look at the, the problems and the issues um, uh, comparable to other culture and mega changes that you want to initiate. I think it requires a certain amount of patience and realism in your planning, but a lot of unrealism, impatience and directness in the way you put things into actions. Now, our company, we take wood and we turn it into biodegradable and compostable fibers for the um, textile industry. And we're investing at the moment more than $2 billion into climate neutral or climate positive um, large sites in all parts of the world. I think the challenge that we are facing um, when it comes to wood is that it is one of the great resources our world has if managed well. It is a carbon capture. It is a climate neutral um, raw material. Um, that we can use if we can do it, if you do it well. I think the responsibilities of business is to make it an issue, to make the deforestation issue, to make responsible forest management an issue without falling into a dogma. And when I, what I mean by making it an issue, I think we need to be very outspoken towards consumers, towards government, towards competitors and outspoken in a, in a way that you, we need to make clear um, what good forest management means. However, we also need to be confrontative and direct um, on when it comes to governments, when it comes to industry players who, to your own opinion, um, don't play it well. I think this directness in the end pays off. This courage, this courage on leadership level is required. But it requires first that you walk the talk and do things well. And we can say from own experience how difficult it is to 
um, in such an emotional subject as forests to keep facts straight and to make sure that you inform well. I think as long as you remain patient and realistic and impatient in your actions, I think there's a very fair chance that you can, as a business, help to make big progress. I think for organizations such as the World Bank or large institutions, I would have one plea um, continue to make the professional due diligence as IFC, for example, has done it in our case, but also avoid that you become a platform for greenwashing, which is also something that I've seen in the past. Paul Polman, over 1,000 businesses have now committed to make their operations net zero in line with the Paris Agreement. With all these solutions around, shouldn't value chains be included in these commitments? And if yes, what can be done to increase business ambition? Well, uh, just building on the responsible business comment, there's no question that the role of business in society is first and foremost to profitably address the issues of people and planet. Just CSR, corporate social responsibility, or being less bad is just not good enough anymore. World Overshoot Day last year was August 27th. Uh, August 22nd, which means that after that day, we're using more resources than the world can replenish. We're actually stealing from future generations. So we need to start to think regenerative and we need to take responsibility of our total impact in society to get there. So obviously, we need to take the uh, ambitious targets into our total value chain and actually beyond into our total impact in society. There are only eight supply chains in the world, actually, that account for 50% of the global emissions. And we've talked about some of them, like food or construction or fashion or fast-moving consumer goods or uh, automotive. It's very easy to target, in my opinion, with, uh, with some of the uh, partnerships that need to be formed between government, civil society, and the private mm -hmm. sector. None of them can do that alone. Now, the beauty is, with some work that has been done with the World Economic Forum, that if you work together across the value chain, there's only a very small marginal cost for the consumer to attack these issues. In fact, already today, as I mentioned, half of the emissions in the supply chain can be covered with a $10 per ton price for carbon and be immediately profitable. In fact, um, if you attack the value chains in these industries that I mentioned, uh, the marginal cost increases on the end product is estimated to be between 1% and 4%. So forging these partnerships across these value chains are important. You see Walmart doing that with their one gigaton initiative, uh, Unilever and Salesforce uh, requiring all their key suppliers to stick to the one and a half degrees, which is the net zero by 2050. You see Apple making commitments on 100% carbon neutrality in its supply chain by 2040. You see even companies right. like Tesco, a major retailer in the UK, starting to finance suppliers. So we need to set that as the benchmark for all companies to follow. Stefan, you recently invested in one of the most energy efficient pulp mills in the world, in Brazil. So what is your message to consumers about low carbon fibers? Are you able to capitalize on your green investments and, and drive more demand for your products? 70% of the consumers we serve are fashion consumers, are fashionista. Um, the total textile and fashion industry has more than 100 million tons of waste um, every year. And the way we have been communicating to them is via brands. Um, Tencel, a brand that um, you know, communicates to them, you know, buy responsibly, and you don't need to really make a big compromise. Be interested in care. I think the advantage in the fashion industry, you can look at your label, be interested in what product is in there, and um, a kilogram of tensile consumes a factor 20 less than the same amount of, of cotton. Um, it decomposes in water in a couple of weeks compared to a couple of centuries when it is um, polyester. So consumer care, we, consume, we communicate this by our ingredient brands, despite the fact that we are five steps up the value chain. And in essence, like Paul said, we're speaking about a 10 cent per shirt, 5 cent per T-shirt, which is the difference between microplastics, water consumption that is high, or something that is fully biodegradable and comes from renewable resources. So in essence, be interested in making a responsible choice. 
10 cent on a on a t-shirt or on a, on a or on a, on a shirt is something that this planet and our children i think should worth, should be worth to us yeah. So, I mean, a T-shirt is one thing. A house is a, a, a very different affair. Domingo Valdez, Vinte offers housing that is both affordable and green, but is green more expensive? How do you integrate green buildings and maintain affordability for the end user? Ah, well, that is true. Delivering green and social impact is more expensive, uh, but also it implies savings for a long time to our customers in energy and in water. For example, they are now saving more than 300,000 cubic meters of water each year. Um, the key is making a, a, a much better overall product than the increase in price. Customers are willing to pay a little extra for improving their way of living, no doubt about that. Um, we also save in lines of credits uh, with up to 25 basis points for, from facilities like the one we have signed with the IFC and we pass along all those savings directly into the product and price. Um, green innovation also makes making developments possible, otherwise we'll be running out of underground water, for example, and therefore there will be no more home construction permits. Uh, we have built and donated nine water treatment plants and developed 329 global uh, absorption systems that return, return rainwater into underground rivers in Mexico. Um, so these investments have a huge positive impact for, for clean water. Uh, they're living a better life and it is our commitment to keep making better communities, that's for sure. And Didi, can we just stay a bit on this theme of intersectional crises and interconnected solutions? Could you perhaps tell us how you see improving gender diversity along value chains and how it might lead to positive environmental and socioeconomic change? So I, I take gender diversity as a cue for generally enhancing diversity and inclusion in terms of how business is conducted. And um, of course, women are over half of the workforce and, and much beyond the workforce, at least in African culture, um, women have always been the bedrock and um, backing of the economic structure in the community. So from that perspective, also from an African point of view, um, there have been significant examples of how revolutions have happened simply because of a different approach and a different perspective, which is the outcome of more inclusion and diversity. One of these is clearly um, in banking and finance, uh, but what Africa achieved, and Nigeria in particular, is that we were able to leapfrog the brick and mortar system in order to improve um, ecological impact by Im introducing digital um, finance and mobile banking, which is much further ahead than many other economies that started before us. Uh, the same case with um, the telecommunications um, sector, where when I joined um, the Nigerian regulator for telecommunications and started working with them, um, we had 400,000 landlines, and we leapfrogged that over a 10-year period to achieve 80 million mobile phones, unlocking significant potential for um, women in particular, but also for young people to be able to access uh, economic inclusion, financial inclusion, digital inclusion, because they suddenly had mobile phones. And of course, if you think about it in terms of um, negative ecological impact, you would agree that having um, mobile technology uh, was much more um, alleviating to the environment than building all of that physical infrastructure in such a short space of time. Um, the third is actually strongly linked to that in the sense that we are very much in a, an ecologically tilted um, power um, revolution with mini grids and micro grids that are much more renewable energy um, um, sourced rather than fossil fuel um, driven. That, that is something that is consciously happening. And because a lot of our um, economy is fueled, uh, really 65% in the informal sector, in some cases even more, what that means is that women 
and enabling women to have access to capital through digital banking, access to power through renewable energy, access to telecommunication, which means communication and impact is better, means that you're actually through those actions, including women in the economy, and also having a significant um, positive ecological impact. And um, the last, which is perhaps the most impactful um, revolution that I see as ongoing um, in the on the African continent, and that will significantly unleash um, a, a significant chunk of our workforce, including women, but also a young population, which on the African continent is a huge um, demography. Again, about sixty percent of our population is blockchain-enabled economic inclusion and personal fulfillment possibilities. What we've said um, over the last 22 years working with the Growing Businesses Foundation and what we've seen is that when we empower a woman entrepreneur, we're at the same time empowering entire communities, empowering her, whole, her household, and very even often even empowering her husband. Um, and, and so we think that smart contracts that sit at the core of blockchain technology help us reintroduce the trust that makes societies work through a digital and technological revolution. And what is really important for that on the African continent is that really what this does is two things. One is it strikes into the cultural roots of how we do business, namely community oriented, much more sustainable, definitely circular, and definitely founded on trust um, and inclusive. And more importantly, what happens is we're achieving digital and financial inclusion without as much ecological disruption. And what we found also is that when it comes to things that have to do with personal fulfillment that has a positive impact on the community and is more holistic and inclusive, women have a very, very important voice. And that female voice is so critical also in terms of risk mitigation. It's really important in terms of ensuring that the governance structures of an organization or generally of the economic or the political um, um, governance structures are improved because that voice matters so much. But I, I want to take um, gender diversity and inclusion as well as ensuring that we have more young people at the table and more importantly that we have a more multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary um, approach to the way we address things. And inclusion and diversity can only help in terms of mitigating risk, being innovative, finding new solutions, and actually tackling these problems that are so urgent so that we emerge out of this emergency um, of climate, economic, and social crisis that we're in. James, we are seeing a major shift in consumer demand for products that do not contribute to climate change. Is this trend likely to continue? And are businesses listening? Yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, when, the way that we look at it is, you know, we're not going to be successful if the sustainable solution uh, costs more or is more difficult. We have to make the sustainable choice the, the most cost effective, the, the easiest choice. And so we start to look at the this this food waste um, in, in our case as not so much a tax on the food system, but what if we looked at it as actually this bank account that we had because of waste gotten used to paying for all of this waste in the system. And if we could use technology to reduce that waste, that that tax actually becomes a bank account. And by reducing the waste, we start to free up money within the system. And when we free up that money, we can start to create incentives for people to adopt a food system that looks after more people and our planet at the same time. And that really comes down to finding a business model, um, looking at the entire supply chain and figuring out where are there inefficiencies in the supply chain today and what technologies exist that we can use to reduce those inefficiencies so that we actually make people more money by doing 
the more sustainable thing. And if we do that, then we move from the market segment of people who are willing to pay a little bit more because they're knowledgeable enough about the, the world to understand that that sets us on a better course into the market segment of people who care about the environment, but don't have the economic means to be able to afford that thing that, that costs more money. And so we look at it through the lens of it's kind of our job as industry to figure out how do you marry technology and business model to unlock economic value in a way that incentivizes the adoption of a more sustainable, uh, in our case, food system. Thank you to all of our panelists there for that great discussion. Now, thinking about sustainable business models, how to implement them, how to make them successful, that isn't just something that CEOs are thinking about. We also asked some younger professionals to tell us their thoughts. Abir Hussain and Alina Karim shared with us their insights on how to mainstream sustainable business solutions and how to report better and avoid greenwashing. Hello, uh, my name is Abir Hussein. I'm originally from Bangladesh, but right now I'm based in Sweden. I work as consultant of sustainable business development. Today, I will be talking about making sustainable solutions mainstream. So to maintain the global temperature increase below 1.5 degrees Celsius level, we need to make sure that sustainable solutions are in place and are in widely used in the society. There are already many sustainable solutions uh, in the world today. For an example, plant-based food, which can release agricultural land to sequester between five gigaton to 10 gigaton of CO2 emissions per year. And there are also many solutions for, like alternative to plastic, some other nature-based solutions. But surprisingly, all these solutions are yet to become a mainstream widely used in the society. So the question is why they are not being able to come mainstream? Is it the concern of profitability from the business which is the hinder? Or is it the consumer behavior which is the hinder here? We must address these fundamental questions. In my ordinary work as sustainable business development uh, consultant, I engage with a lot of big corporations and I often get to hear from them that they have their mandate that they would like to transform their existing products or materials into sustainable materials by 2030. But they want that, for an example, a comprehensive solution right away in the place. So again, the question is why to wait for, you know, a comprehensive solution for 10 years and depend on others to bring that solution, whereas we already have some solutions to start off with. On the other hand, we have SMEs, small and medium enterprises, who are the innovation driver, and they are already ready with their own sustainable solutions, but they're struggling to scale them up. So one thing we have to consider here, like we have to start somewhere. Changes will not happen overnight. So we need to go beyond talking and with real action. See here, I would like to propose three to four specific actions that we should take right away. So first one is we need to demonstrate more and more all the existing sustainable solutions that we have today. We also need to encourage the big corporations to support the SMEs in, in scaling up their existing sustainable solutions. We also need to influence our government procurement policies to use the already proven sustainable solutions in their process. And last but not the least, we can also make sure that all the global, regional, and national forums and discussions, some of the sustainable solutions are being demonstrated. So all these actions will create a spillover effect and it will encourage further innovation. And the innovators and the SMEs, they will feel like, yes, their innovation for climate action is actually getting its own future. So fundamentally, this will also encourage further injection of private investment into scaling up of these solutions. So in conclusion, in my view, mainstreaming the existing sustainable solution while looking for the new ones is the right path to reach our destiny. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone, this is Alina Karim from Pakistan. Today I'll be talking about sustainability reporting and greenwashing. Climate crisis is a global challenge and global solidarity is required to tackle it. This can be achieved through transformation of energy sources and industrial systems, climate finance and reporting, and climate education. Continued energy transition away from fossil fuels towards renewable energy, new agreements of re reduced carbon emissions, and inclusion of diverse voices is a must to achieve the 1.5 degrees global warming limit and a sustainable future for humanity. Many countries and organizations have committed to becoming net zero or carbon neutral between 2030 and 2050. But the effectiveness of the actions to fulfill this commitment can only be achieved through effective reporting of activities being conducted. Internationally, businesses are accountable to stakeholders for ESG, sustainability reporting, and climate-related financial disclosures. And these are the need of the R to reflect the impact that they are making on the environment. Many organizations understand this need, but are using greenwashing for, improve, uh, for improved public image by putting on a guise of being green and eco-conscious through their marketing, but not upholding these values in their actions and practice. Sustainability reporting by relevant qualified finance professionals needs to be implemented for effective results. It is essential that organizations include climate impact in decision making at all stages of operations. The mandatory shift to sustainability reporting can be gradual depending upon the nature and size of organizations. However, the voluntary shift can be driven globally by demand from stakeholders, especially investors and consumers. The sustainability reporting should include a holistic impact of organization on climate change, human rights, diversity, inclusion, ethics and governance, and supply chain. Implementation of climate-related financial disclosure standards by global sustainability and integrated reporting organizations like CDP, CDSP, GRI, IIRC, and SASP are the way forward. The public sector also needs to tackle climate crisis through public sector sustainability reporting. Governments can play a crucial role in the field of sustainability reporting as regulators, investors, reporters and policy makers. Reporting on new reforms and policies for suspension of coal projects and compulsion on banks and financial institutions to incorporate ESG principles are examples of ways through which governments can help accelerate climate action. Hoping for a sustainable future for all of us. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Thank you both very much indeed. And don't forget to check out www.innovateforclimate.com for more videos just like these from young innovators, entrepreneurs and climate champions from around the world. Again, a really great reminder of just how interconnected climate solutions could be, whether for a country, community or a business. And our final guest today knows that only too well. Now, as many of you know, COP26 is a key moment on the horizon to accelerate climate action. To talk to us about the lead up to that event, we can now welcome Patricia Espinoza, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words today. Colleagues, I am often asked if I am feeling optimistic about the state of progress on climate negotiations. On one hand, the statistics point to the urgency of the global climate emergency. On the other hand, I have been encouraged by recent developments on the world stage. Last month's US Leader Summit is a case in point where more than 40 nations representing 80% of global emissions participated. We saw the announcement of some new and enhanced NDCs, as well as plans to achieve net zero by specific dates and with timelines. All that said, simply aiming for net zero in 2050 will not be sufficient if substantially more ambitious NDCs are not brought forward now. NDCs were due in 2020. While it's important to plan for the future, 
it's important to complete outstanding work already due. COP26 has its own list of unfinished tasks and negotiations nations must complete. One of the main tasks is to drive more climate ambition, not only with respect to mitigation, but to adaptation and especially finance. Finance is the common denominator of almost every single issue on our agenda. It is the basis of trust, the commitment to the future, and where promises become more than words on press releases. Here too, past promises must be fulfilled. The world awaits the mobilization of 100 billion annually by developed nations to developing. This promise extends back to when I was involved in the Cancun agreements prior to the Paris Agreement. In fact, it's one of the main elements ensuring the Paris Agreement would be adopted. In the meantime, we hear promises about climate neutrality, about net zero, about 2050. Ladies and gentlemen, nations still haven't even met the promises they made more than a decade ago. It's a similar story with respect to carbon pricing and carbon markets. There are powerful policy tools for governments to achieve their climate goals. An ever-increasing number of parties are forging plans to put a price signal on carbon emissions. Yet here too, nations find themselves delaying required action. I recall the vision laid out by the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition to have 50% of global greenhouse gas emissions covered by some form of carbon pricing within a decade. We are, unfortunately, still far from that. I recognize it's not an easy task, but it's a necessary one to complete. Carbon pricing plans have an essential role to play in helping countries get to net zero emissions. Yet, the lack of finalized and agreed rules around Article 6 at the moment should not hold nations back from implementing their homegrown policies as part of their domestic climate change activity. When crafting such policies, policymakers can already integrate in their plans the potential use of cooperative action enabling countries to be ready once rules for Article 6 are adopted. For my part, I will continue to work my hardest to remind parties that they must come to an agreement on Article 6 this year in Glasgow. We cannot continue delaying action from COP to COP. That being said, I am pleased to note our partnership with the World Bank in promoting the adoption of collaborative instruments globally. It is my hope that we will continue this fruitful collaboration at the PMI stage. That will surely nurture the next generation of carbon pricing practitioners in a growing range of countries. Finally, and in keeping with the partnership theme, I am pleased that the Secretariat and the World Bank are together with the UNDP and UNEP, jointly delivering the 2021 Regional Climate Weeks. A few weeks ago, a virtual thematic session for the Latin American and Caribbean took the pulse of climate action in the region, explored challenges and opportunities, and showcased ambitious solutions. The upcoming events in Africa, Asia, and the Pacific will offer a similar platform for regional stakeholders to have their voice heard and so contribute and build momentum towards success at COP26. It is only by working collaboratively that we can achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot afford to slow down. These are crucial days, days that may ultimately determine whether we successfully address climate change or not. 
despite the challenges, I remain optimistic that we can deliver at COP26 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia Espinosa, for that informative look into the lead up to COP26. So this brings us to the end of today's plenary session. You can join the workshops that you've chosen to attend today. And I'm going to be back shortly to introduce our closing session. We're going to be joined by Jürgen Fergler, Vice President Sustainable Development at the World Bank. And we'll be addressing some of those questions that you've asked during this Innovate for Climate event. So don't miss that and I'll see you later. Thank you.